I would like to introduce four of our stellar authors who are going to join us over the course of the weekend. And as I mentioned your name, you could come up and there's a, an easier way to the stage over here and you can sit at one of the stools. Um, so as I, met, as I read very short biographies, I'll have our four guests come to the stage. Jane Monroe is a Canadian poet, writer, and educator. Her poetry collection, Blue Sonoma, won the 2015 Griffin Poetry Prize. Jane's recent books include Open Every Window and the poetry collections Glass Float and False Creek. She has taught creative writing at universities across British Columbia, led writing workshops, and has given readings around the world. Welcome to the stage, Jane. You can come on up. Don Mackay is a poet, teacher, and editor. He has published more than a dozen books in a career that spans five decades. He has twice won the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry and won the Griffin Poetry Prize in 2007. His previous essay collections include Vis-a-Vis, -vis, Field Notes on Poetry and Wilderness, Deactivated West 100, and Shell of the Tortoise, winner of the 2011 BMO Winterset Award. Mackay lives in St. John's, Newfoundland. Marlene Kreitz is an environmental artist and poet. A major theme of her work is the relationship between human beings and the land, and she often photographs subtle traces and marks of human presence in natural environments. Her work has been shown in over 300 exhibitions worldwide. She was a 2019 recipient of the Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts. Welcome, Marlene. And Larry Towell is one of Canada's most decorated photojournalists and Canada's first photographer to join the prestigious photo agency Magnum. In 1996, he completed a monograph based on the Civil War in El Salvador, followed by book, a book on Palestine. His fascination with landlessness also led him to the Mennonite migrant workers of Mexico. After receiving the Henri Cartier-Bresson Award, the inaugural, Award, Larry finished a second book on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, No Man's Land, and followed, are followed by The World from My Front Porch and Afghanistan. Larry is also, and we're going to discover this this weekend, a gifted musician and songwriter. Welcome our group to the stage. Okay. So I'm going to start us off by saying that each of our artists who are on the stage with us, artists and authors tonight, have been inspired by place in their work, inspired by the natural environment, by spaces in Canada, by places around the world. And I'd like to start with Don. If you have lived across Canada from Vancouver Island to your current home in Newfoundland, but you grew up in Ontario and discovered your mutually enfolding passions for poetry, and the natural world and landscapes of, on your, of your Ontario youth. In your essay, Why Poetry, a short personal essay on a soaring subject, you pinpoint the moment you got hooked on poetry in a place called Hawk Cliff on the shore of Lake Erie in Southern Ontario. Can you tell us about this moment and how it inspired such a profound poetic calling? Okay. Oh, there we, there we are. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I uh, I was already uh, hooked on poetry when I went to Hawk Cliff, but then I got at Hawk Cliff I got hooked on bird watching. It was um, so it, yeah. It was so fantastic. I went to the Hawk Cliff, you know, down on the shores of Lake Erie. So many of you've been there probably, right? If you haven't, go. You know, you too could be become a crazy bird addict. <laughs> like me, spent the rest of your life as an incompetent bird watcher. That's, I did, yeah, so that's how I done it. But, except then I got hooked on rock formations when I lived in BC, and I realized I didn't have to spend the rest of my life as an incompetent bird watcher. I could also be an incompetent geologist. So I, that's where I went. But yes, Hawkleaf was fantastic. Um, I, I remember it vividly going in the first time. And the guy came over, which was a banding station right nearby, right? And a man came over and stood in the back of a, of a pickup with an orange juice can in his hand. And he took it and he said, okay, here it is. And he took the, lid off, took the can off the bird and there was a kestrel and just looked right through us. Just fantastic. And I thought, well, 
I was, I was, the, I was a goner from then. It was too bad because I was teaching, you know, at Western, and the best time to go at Hot Cliff is sort of late September <laughs> when the bird migration is coming down. So I wasn't too long into the course, and I was teaching sort of mid-afternoon, and the conditions were just absolutely perfect for broadwing migrations. I was looking out the window. <laughs> I, could see, I could just feel the broadwings coming down. <laughs> Like where is I was thinking, God, how long is this going? I'm having a problem. <laughs> but you know, class, I think that's probably enough talk about <laughs> that's amazing. WB Yates for today. And uh, <laughs> so we'll see you again Monday. <laughs> down, down I was, I was gone. Just occurred to me that some of you might have been in that class. So. <laughs> I'll give you 20 deathless minutes on WB Yates. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, just Call Kitty Lewis, who does all my affairs like that, if you need to get a, <laughs> an appointment for that. So yeah, Hawcliffe was fantastic. And that's one of the things about Southern Ontario, you think, well, how can you be an echo poet in Southern Ontario because it's just farmland and so on and so forth, but has this wonderful, I mean, it's on a major migration route. So anybody who wanted to introduce into becoming an environmentalist, a kid, so on and so forth, take them to Hawcliffe, Kettle Point, of course, Point Peely, uh, and so on. And all the little conservation areas dotted around Ontario, all these little gems of wildness that are there. It's so valuable. That's amazing. Uh, so on. That's we're cool. going to have a Enough book of me. That we're going to have a book of poetry at the festival on uh, an island just below Point Peely called Middle Island. Uh, D.A. Lockhart's new poetry book. So look out for that one. Uh, Marlene, you have noted that your work has an abiding underlying interest in place, and yet not place as a geographical location, but as a process that involves memory, multiple narratives, ecology, and language. In 2002, if I have that date correct, you moved to a very special place in Portugal Cove, Newfoundland, a place that transformed your work. Can you tell us about this very special place in Newfoundland? Oh, thank you very much. Um, I was living in downtown St. John's for about 12 years in one of those classic little Victorian clapboard houses where the front door opens onto the sidewalk. There's no setback. There was no backyard. And so I traveled all the time to find my subject matter for my work because I was working outside using the landscape as my subject matter. Um, I'm not a studio artist. I don't go into a studio and make things. I do my work directly outside. And um, I started to find that downtown St. John's was just getting too busy, too noisy. Cruise ships were starting to come in, so there'd be like three to 4,000 people, I mean, enormous cruise ships. Three to 4,000 people would offload, and my house was just about three streets from the, where these cruise ships were parking. So your whole everyday space was just getting completely overrun. Um, and so I started looking for a place outside of town. It took me a couple of years to find the place that I have now. Uh, it's in Portugal Cove, which is not very far from downtown, but I'm living right within a patch of old growth boreal forest that's right on the edge of the Blast Hole Pond Conservation Area, which I helped establish once I got there. And that's 920 acres of old growth boreal forest. and that has become my studio. Like that is where I pay attention and do my work and I don't have to travel um, to the extent that I did, which suits me very well as I get older. That's amazing. And I'm gonna ask you a little uh, very soon about some of the work that you do there too. Uh, Jane, your most recent book of poetry, False Creek, is most certainly inspired by place, by the spaces and histories of Vancouver, by your walks through the city, by its libraries, galleries, museums, by your dream life. Could you tell us about False Creek? Uh, many might not be familiar with it here. Um, how did False Creek open a space to reflect on Vancouver and your sense of place? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I came back to Vancouver, <clears throat> excuse me, after, 20 years of living on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island um, in a, quite a wilderness sort of area, point no point. And I came back 
although I had grown up in Vancouver and realized I didn't know very much about the details of its history. And um, I had grown up in North Vancouver, and as a small child, I had wandered. I, it was in that generation when our parents were certainly not helicopter parents, and I was allowed to head off in the morning, just saying what direction I was going and being warned I needed to appear for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I wandered and I could go up mountains and I followed rivers. I, I explored the Capilano Canyon from, well, above the Cleveland, what's the Cleveland Dam now, down to the ocean. And I, I was fascinated by who lived there the plants and the animals, and I would look at them and pay attention to them. So that was my background, and then I went out to Point No Point, and again, I was living with a lot of natural environment, and I wandered and walked. Don and I actually hiked together along the, the mountain trails when you were doing strike slip. And if you come to our reading, <laughs> I will have a surprise for Jane that she doesn't oh. know about. I love the sounds of this already. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So, um, <laughs> but then I came back to Vancouver and I, I walked. I walked around Falls Creek because there's a seawall all around Falls Creek. For those of you who don't know Vancouver, Falls Creek is an inlet in the heart of Vancouver. And it's, uh, I, discovered quite quickly in doing my research that it is now one-fifth of the size that it was naturally. All of the um, tidal flats, much of the shoreline, a whole bunch of the eastern side of False Creek has been filled in. And the city dumped rubbish and garbage to fill in all that land, which is now False Creek Flats, and supports institutions like um, Emily Carr University of Art and Design, the new one, a lot of big um, techni technological buildings, and um, it's, it's right in the middle parts of Vancouver, this infilled area that was False Creek. So I began to understand I didn't know very much about this, and I certainly did not know very much about the people who lived there in the original years, the, um, especially the Tsleil-Lituth and the Squamish and the Musqueam peoples, who had, who, for whom um, a Musqueam poet told me, Falls Creek was like a supermarket. And now that Granville Island, with its big market, uh, is um, kind of a, not a supermarket, but a marketplace for the Vancouver area. Um, she was telling me that it was like that for the Tsleil-Lituth and the uh, Squamish and the Musqueam people who would come into False Creek for the, the foods that they could gather there. Anyway, I, I walked False Creek, and as I walked, I began to think about various things which ended up being um, inspiring poems and working with that. Amazing. I'm going to come back and ask about some of those things too. Um, though, uh, second here. Make sure I've got my right question here for uh, Larry. Um, yes, uh, Larry, you are also uh, 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 somebody who works in... Um, photography and journalism, but you have described music as a sister, a kind of sister accompaniment to your work, uh, which allows you to engage audiences and animate the work in the setting of performance. Can you talk about how you married uh, photography and songwriting in your art practice? Um, and I think maybe poetry and uh, songwriting uh, predate this. But in your practice, uh, there's a prevailing theme of dispossession of uh, landlessness. And I wondered if you could talk about uh, that as a, a, a theme and a thesis that runs through the performance. What if I said no? <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, well, you know, um, I guess as a man of peace, I found myself in a lot of war zones over my life, and it wasn't really intentional. I became interested in issues of human rights in Central America in the days when Ronald Reagan was president and he was attempting to turn the whole region into a, a burned out landscape. And um, it's when I started in, I guess, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, that I realized there weren't wars going on, there were rebellions of landless people. Um, and that's sort of what drove I guess my understanding, and I appreciated what Andre Picard said tonight. I tell stories, and I try to I try and make them digestible. So the performance is sort of a way of doing that. It's a way of of showing work. As a photographer, you have to witness things. You can't talk about it or think about it or even write about it unless you can document it. So the um, the backbone of that performance I'm doing tomorrow night with Anne Lindsay, who's a uh, the real musician in this room is uh, backing me up as well as Mike Stevens, a great harmonica player. And in the process of, of the show, I sing and I play. And all my life as I traveled in these parts of the world, I often wrote. Um, so I find that, you know, suffering is universal. And dispossession has become an endemic. Mm. It's become endemic, I should say, and it's become a pandemic. And we hardly, we cannot keep up with the flow of human beings escaping, mostly conflict. Um, and they're dispossessed people, all of them. So as much as um, I can say it, it seems like a niche talking about dispossession, it's the universal theme of our age. And um, in order to try and make sense of it, I have to tell stories. I usually tell stories in photographs. Photographs are um, documentary photographs. You can't set up in your studio. You can't recreate things because you can't set your pictures up. You go somewhere and you witness and you, you um, integrate with the community who've become your friends. Um, you document their lives. You sequence the work, you try and publish it. Originally, or initially in magazines or the popular media, back in the days when mag serious magazines existed, which they don't anymore. And then you make them into books, and eventually you might make them into slideshows. So what I'm doing right now, I'm 70 years old, I'm not traveling quite as much. My last serious trip was in, to the Ukraine after Russia invaded which is gonna be in the show tomorrow night as well. Um, I try and um, use music and lyrics as a way of, I guess, stitching together some of the communities of dispossession that I've had the great honor to, uh, to be a part of. Amazing, and bearing witness to so much. Um, I highly recommend those last few tickets, uh, if you can grab one to, to see Larry uh, tomorrow night. Uh, Marlene, though you are also widely known for your award-winning photography, you have recently said, I've come to a stage in my life where I value the exquisite lightness of words. They don't require frames or shipping crates or rented storage space. Could you tell us more of your turn to words, to poetry in your art practice? What inspired this shift in your work? Thank you for that question. Um, I never know what's cup, you know, what you're going to call next. They have no idea what I'm going to ask them. <laughs> we didn't get any prep on this. In fact, we were told, don't, don't prepare anything. Although I do have one thing I do want to say. You but, but I'll answer the question first. <laughs> yeah. um, so as I was working in the boreal forest, there were things that I noticed and things that happened that weren't necessarily visual. They weren't necessarily something I could take a photograph of, or if it was, it was maybe really, really fleeting and I didn't have my camera. And it was particularly sounds that I found really vivid. And how was I going to deal with some of these other 
uh, senses beyond the visual. So I turned to words. And I started writing very short haiku-like poems. And I wrote them on cards. And I set them up right in the spot where the words occurred to me and photographed the poem in place. So they weren't photoshopped in. Like I actually wrote the poem by hand and set it up. I had a little prop, a way to set it up um, in, in the, on site. But then I started writing poems that were too long to fit on these little cards. And I thought, well, now what am I going to do? I didn't want them just printed on the page in a book that someone else would read. It wouldn't suit at all. I needed the poems to be in place, like literally in place. So I thought, well, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to invite people to come here, and I'll read them the poem out loud right in the spot where the words arose. So that eventually evolved into, so that's what I started doing. I started inviting people to come for a poetry walk around the place. And then I started getting really interested in having other collaborators on these walks. So I've had acoustic musicians, contemporary dancers who choreographed, choreographed dance in relationship to the terrain. I've had a shadow puppet maker who made a portable little um, shadow puppet theater when the theme, like the, all these walks had themes to them. Um, so there, they were shadow puppets of the local mammals and all of the poems that we read um, were on the local mammals. Um, and then I also started inviting natural historians. So I had a geologist that told us about the geology right where we were standing. A mycologist who told us about all the fungi and mycelia underground right where we were standing. A freshwater biologist because there's a small river, which I'm going to talk about a lot on the panel on Sunday. Amazing. Yeah, there's that little. Yeah, there's the plug. It. There's you the plug. Gave, he told us we were supposed to be teasers yep. for, the, <laughs> for the next event. You're doing amazing. So that it became a real inter crossing between the arts and the sciences. And what I say is, the reason that worked so well is because we were actually standing in the natural environment. If we were up here on the stage talking about the mycelium and reading a poem, it just wouldn't work the same as actually being in the place. And right. I've now transitioned to doing this for school children, grade three and four school children. I started doing this last year, and they're, they're my favorite age. They're really curious. They're really interested. They're, they're, they've got so much learning already that they ask really intelligent questions. And so when I was doing it for the general public, I did about 40 events, and about 900 people came over the years I was doing it. Wow. But I always have to qualify that as saying it wasn't 900 different people. <laughs> <laughs> there were some people that came every single year, which is what forced me to coming up with a new theme every year. Right. Um, and now I'm doing it for grade three and four, so it's like age eight, nine, ten uh, children, and I'm just loving it. That's amazing. I'm loving doing it for the children. And it's from the local elementary school in the town where I live. Right. And the project, if you want to look it up um, in advance of coming to Gardenship and State's event on Sunday afternoon to hear more about this, is the Boreal Poetry Garden. Dawn, you have been a frequent collaborator and contributor to the Boreal Poetry Garden. I wonder if you could talk about how this collaboration has enhanced your poetry and artistic practice. Uh, have the walks and engagement events changed your approach to poetic composition and presentation? Yes, very much. Yes, very much. I also have uh, uh, very important functions in, in the Boyle Poetry Garden. Parking attendant was one. <laughs> Security. And box office. Box office and um, bartender. I was like... And moose, and, moose and horn also, player. Also I, was, also, also, I got to... I got to uh, write some poems specifically for that, which you can hear when I read. <laughs> I'm going to have a section on these <laughs> when I'm reading with Jane. On uh, amazing, Sunday. this is uh, we're, they're doing so well at this. Right. <laughs> Uncoached. <laughs> he has unleashed the hidden shill in all of this. 
I, I love it. You know, you have a lot to answer for, Josh, I must say. <laughs> That's right. No, it's true. And so it, I, what I found, like, just what Marlene was saying was, like, it was, especially for somebody who's been in academia for a, a while, I spent, you know, 30 years teaching that, you could feel the silos crashing. And you just go from a geologist talking about this to a, 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 a musician writing t the next second you go on to somebody else who's doing some other artwork and it was, there was no sense of that, oh, aren't we wonderful, we're being interactive, it was just that. And then we'd have a garage party afterwards in, in Marlene's place and everybody mingled, it was fantastic. Fun. Fun. Amazing. Amazing. Jane, uh, like Marlene's deep dive into the six acre patch of boreal forests in Portugal Cove, Newfoundland, you did such extensive research to reimagine your sense of place. In particular, you took courses and you, you highlighted to this, but I'd like to see if you can, um, you can tease this out a bit for us on decolonial aesthetics at Emily Carr and engaged with indigenous artists in the region. How did this experience reshape your understanding of False Creek in Vancouver? Uh, well, as I said, I came back and realized I didn't know very much. <laughs> I mean, I don't know very much anyway, and I still don't know very much. But um, I felt that I needed to learn more. And one of the ways that I found to do that was to uh, take an, in a course at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, although I'm not a visual artist, um, on decolonial aesthetics. And this was absolutely fascinating for me because I did all of the reading and then I listened to the indigenous artists who came and talked about their work and even more importantly to me, they talked about their feelings and their what motivated them as artists and what kept them going and their griefs and their fears and uh, how I come from a, very colonial background. My, my grandfather, who was a visual artist, actually painted the murals of the bare-breasted uh, indigenous women in the legislature in BC, in Victoria, which have now been covered up. <laughs> and it's been quite the controversy. But I, um, I grew up not really having the sensitivity and the knowledge and the understanding of what the people who lived in these areas, the forests that I walked through and the rivers that I followed, all were well known. And I could feel this as a child. I knew that these places had people who knew them and had languages with which they, they conversed about them. But I didn't know those languages. I still don't know the languages. But I began, anyway, so I did that. I also did research in the Beatty Botanical Museum to learn about the, um, the various plants and animals and all of the things that were living in that area that are no longer there, M many of them no longer there, and so on. So uh, this was, this was a, a very engaging and fascinating um, study for me, and it, it's part of what makes that book. But I also want to give a plug for my workshop. <laughs> yes, you should. Um, I, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow um, uh, called Our Earth, Our Poems, Your Work Now. And I'm asking you, what are you called to do? As witnesses in an era of crisis, what are you called to do? And how does this translate into poetry? Or what is it that you are called to do? And so for two hours, we're going to work with this. And individually, um, you'll be challenged and given time to do some writing, but we'll also I will read things that might inspire you and give you some frameworks and ideas for how you could structure and begin to work on it. And what an amazing opportunity to come. And that will be here in the boardroom at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, at 12 noon. 
isn't it? 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no. It's, 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 Good thing we clarified yeah. this uh, Thank you. right now. Thank you. Yes. yes. So, Larry, <laughs> you currently live on a 75-acre farm in southern Ontario, and you own a, a uh, and your own place inspired, at least in part, the work you did on The World from My Front Porch, a gorgeous book. But you've also noted that your, your book on the Mennonites, which uh, has been reprinted and is available for sale here, um, that you've noted that that book began because you discovered them here in Canada, right in your backyard, to quote you. How has your own experience of place, of owning land, of being on the land, shaped your work? Um, yeah, so I don't know. Um, I'm a rural person. I guess uh, I've always felt a sort of attachment to, uh, to the land under my feet. And <clears throat> as a photojournalist, I used to travel. I still travel. I tried to travel mostly in the winter and in the fall, where I did a lot of my work because we do have children and I wanted, I didn't want to live out of a suitcase like a lot of my peers did. So I can remember driving around and I saw these people out in uh, vegetable fields and tomato fields and cucumber fields, women with long flowered dresses and, and um, big broad hats and men in overalls. And I says, what strange looking people? I wonder who they are. So I went out and I started talking and struck up friendships with families. And they were Mennonite migrant workers who had come from Mexico. Now they have a long history. <clears throat> um, this particular group was Germanic and migrated, you know, were in Europe for two or three hundred years suffering persecution because they believed in the separation of church and state and they were pacifists which was enough to get you killed in those days. So they were persecuted for quite a while and ended up in, in Prussia, which is Poland today. And then they went to the Ukraine, which is in the news. And for the past few years before that, we hadn't heard of it hardly. Uh, anyway, when the Russian Revolution was on the rise, they were persecuted again because they were property owners and they were farmers. And they did not believe in collectivization, which is why Joseph Stalin caused the uh, biggest famine of his day, 30, well, actually, the figures are unknown, but uh, he starved the population of Ukraine to death because they were also, they, they didn't want to collectivize under the state. The Mennonites were part of that group. They left Ukraine and came to Canada, and they settled in Western Canada. Um, they didn't mix in the world. They spoke German. They didn't send their kids to uh, schools, to, to government schools that flew the Union Jack. And um, because then the First World War broke out, and then after the First World War, nobody trusted them because they spoke German. So they wouldn't put the kids in government schools because they didn't believe in the central government here. Um, so they put the Mennonites in jail, and they started to find them. And they said, we can't stay here anymore, we're not welcome. So they loaded their buggies onto trains, and they got off in Chiapas, Mexico, because they worked a deal out with the government that if you leave us alone, we don't have to serve in your military, probably don't have to pay your taxes, we'll take care of our own roads. And they lived in colonies separated from the Spanish culture because they didn't speak Spanish and they still don't. Then the uh, free trade came in with Brian Mulroney and all that stuff and the economy of Mexico was collapsing and the cheese wasn't worth anything because it was cheaper in Texas. So um, they began to come back to Canada as landless people because they were losing their land in Mexico, they couldn't afford to buy it and they were extremely poor farmers. So they ended up in my backyard. <clears throat> the big flow of Mennonites started in the 50s and it peaked in the 70s and 80s. Um, and they were coming as Canadian citizens because their grandparents had been Canadian so they could get Canadian passports. Because they could get Canadian passports, they could drive right in even if they couldn't speak English. But they weren't protected under the labor laws that migrant workers are, say from the Caribbean islands today, which does the rest of our labor that we don't want to do. 
um, and they were going entering into very bad contracts that they couldn't read or write with local farmers who took advantage of them, although not all of them. And that's who I met. So I, used, I would be in the fields with them and photograph, and then they'd invite me to their homes, and then I would photograph there, and then they eventually said, hey, why don't you come to Mexico with us? So I started to go to Mexico with them. We would cross the United States, cross the continent, drive into Mexico, in the northern part of Mexico, keep going south. There's 60 colonies in Mexico. Wow. No, I apologize. 60,000 people, 30 colonies. And I visited most of them over 10 years, at least once, some several times, and developed a relationship with them as migrant workers who were landless people. That's the story. Amazing, my goodness. You may know that Western recently bestowed an honorary degree on Sarah Pauly this past month, uh, who recently won an Oscar for her film Women Talking. What you might not know is that Larry's 10-year project on the Mennonites influenced Sarah's approach to the film and the shots side by side. Yeah, so the impact of that. She work. called me. She called me before she started the film, and she says, can I make this film and use your inspiration? I said, you can do whatever you want. It's like, <laughs> who am I to say? So no, she, we, we chatted about it for quite a while, and she actually went to my agency and bought the rights to uh, copy my work, blah, blah, blah. And so the pictures, they never mentioned the word Mennonite. They, they looked like Mennonites, but it's not really in Mexico. Not in Bolivia, but where is it? It's here in Ontario. Anyway, she's given me credit, too. She's been very gracious about it. It's amazing. It's a, and the impact of the work, it's such a nice homage to, to the incredible work that you did. Okay, final lightning round, and it's going to be the hardest question because it's really capacious. Uh, and then we're going to get some food and something to eat. Uh, but I'd like to return to the words 2023 uh, theme. How do we bring our creativity to address the crises of our moment with care? Jane, your new book confronts the crises of our moment quite directly, and you will be doing this in your poetry workshop to help poets in London to write political poetry without being didactic. What resources can literature and poetry offer us to confront crises, the crises of our moment? Oh, <laughs> wow. Capacious, um, I know. Okay, heart. I think poetry and art take heart and they take all of us. We have to, when we are making art, we are using our whole selves, every aspect of ourselves. That's what can help us. If we can make something that touches hearts and resonates with people, then maybe that will help support them in their very difficult decisions to make changes. And as Andre was saying, to actually act on some of our learning. Amazing, amazing. Marlene, you will be joining the artists of Gardenship and State who have been exploring how environmental arts and activism can open regenerative ecological futures. Has your work in Newfoundland given you a sense of hope for our times of climate emergency? Um, oh my, Josh. Lightning round. <laughs> All right, so I better hurry up. Um, okay. Well, I would like to echo in a way what Jean has just said. I don't know if it's really gonna answer your question, but they are, fi they are finding that the scientific data, and this refers again to a point that Andre made, if you just give people the data and the numbers and the facts, people are tuning out. It's too, it's too depressing, it's too awful. And they are finding that the arts, because it affects us with our feelings, the arts are the thing that can help change minds and with changing minds, change actions and outcomes. So I really think that, well, Jane said it so well, um, the arts are so important. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> Don, as a poet who has always been invested in questions of the natural world, I wonder if I could ask you where you find hope. 
does poetry offer a pathway to regenerative ecological futures? And I wonder how poetics, uh, uh, poetics of wonder or bewilderment, two concepts that you've talked about, uh, can open new futures for us. I agree with Marlene and Jane. <laughs> <laughs> and I, poetry is, is not just an art. It's a natural, it's an essential phenomenon of language. Poetry is the place where language realizes it's inadequate to the world, and yet it must speak. It is both a humbling of, of language and it's kind of desperate longing of our, of our species to actually connect as members of the natural world rather than as masters or even as stewards. This is a, so this is why poetry, no matter how unregarded it is, will never die because this is, this is part of the actual, you know, it's part of language itself. It's uh, us as linguistic creatures. That's what I believe. Right. Brilliant. Amazing. Larry, you have been on the ground as a photojournalist during many of our most critical moments and conflicts of recent history. Do the arts, music, photography have a role to play in helping us imagine a more sustainable, equitable world? Well... <laughs> Putting you all on the spot. You just want me to say yes or no? Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, of course. I mean, what lasted the Roman Empire or Greek culture? We all know that Greek culture lasted, and the Roman Empire did not, right? But um, yeah, what role can the arts play? I mean, I don't know. You know, what do you do? What do you do with your life? You know, uh, first of all, the person has moved as yourself. Um, you share a language, you try and make that language resonate, you try and tell stories that matter, you try and sell more than 100 books, <laughs> you know. Um, it gives me purpose to your life. When I started out, I studied visual arts, and then I moved on, and I went to India, and I did, I did some volunteer work, and I said, I, something's wrong with the world, I, I have to get out of here, and I built a raft, and I lived on it for two and a half years in isolation with a wood stove and this little wee raft I built, and I wrote poetry. But it was bad. <laughs> I didn't realize, I published two books, actually, poetry, but in those days it was easy to publish poetry. You could never publish a photo book. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then uh, I realized I wanted to witness things, and again, getting back to Andre, what he said, Make those, make those stories, translate them into language that people can understand. And what I do tomorrow night is, I guess it's poetry, right? I'm, I'm telling stories using being a songwriter. So I don't know if it's going to make any difference. You know, if you like, a problem is this. If you take the responsibility of changing the world, the world doesn't change. That makes you a failure. So it doesn't matter if you can change the world. What matters is that you have to try. And so you have to, you have to just, you know, when I think about what, what has influenced me and all of you have influences in your life, it's probably not only it's the people you meet, but it's also the things you read and the things you're exposed to. And we're just part of that big, big spinning wheel of information and, and, uh, and, and language. It's, it's, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Wow. Well, I put all of them on the spot to come up with answers with very capacious questions, and uh, I am so grateful in my gratitude for, for your uh, willingness to come to the stage and, and to bear my questions and to aspire us all as we, we launch into the Words Festival. Before we get drinks, I have one last thing I want to do. I have the absolute privilege of presenting an award this evening. In my opening remarks, I noted that words, the Words Festival was established to uh, to celebrate the outstanding history of writers who have a meaningful and significant connection to the city of London and the surrounding area, a mission that is now embodied in the Words Festival Award. We would like to offer the Words Award tonight to our distinguished guest, Don Mackay. For...
For the past 10 years of words, I have tried to follow as best as I can in my own modest way in the footsteps of folks at Western who have tried to bring the literary life of campus together with the arts and culture community of London. Giants like Jamie Rainey, Stan Dragland, Ross Woodman, and Don Mackay. In London, we stand on the shoulders of giants who have been part of our community. After completing a degree at Western and then a PhD at Swansea University College, Wales, Don returned to London in the 1970s to teach English and creative writing at Western. In 1975, he and Stan Dragland established Brick Books, one of the few poetry-only presses in the world. Under Mackay's careful watch, Brick Books has played a foundational role in the flourishing of Canadian literature over the past 50 years. And it began here in London, in the basement of University College and in the libraries of London. While at Western, Don led the way for future writers, poets, and arts leaders to become engaged literary citizens of their community, this community. Though he has had a peripatetic journey across Canada from Vancouver Island to Newfoundland, we have never forgotten just how important he is to London and our arts community. Without his contributions to London, there would be no Words Festival. We're very lucky to have Don with us at Words this year to participate in not one but two events. Tomorrow morning, he will sit uh, with Sally Mackay to talk about their children's book, The Rock Box, and on Sunday, he will join his friend, Jane Monroe, for a reading and conversation. I hope you will all come back for the events this weekend, and I hope this, this uh, gorgeous panel of people up here has inspired you all to visit our wonderful space here at Museum London. As a member of the Words Committee, as a Londoner, as a Canadian, I am pleased to give Don Mackay the 2023 Words Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you.